Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you were able to join us for this event. Um, I'm Rena Kratworth. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Stern Library. Um, this event is the third in a series of three library book talks throughout the academic year. Um, and also just quickly thank you to Eleanor Gourmet and to the Outreach Committee for organizing this event um, in celebration of National Poetry Month. Um, first, the speaker will speak, and then there will be a Q&A with Eleanor, and then we will open the floor up to questions from you, the audience. Um, and also to mention, this year marks the bicentennial of Walt Whitman's birthday. Um, you should have the handout um, that you will find a schedule of events um, that are sort of around town celebrating this anniversary. Um, so check that out. Um, now just, you know, th about our speaker, his bio. Um, Dr. Matt Miller is an associate professor of English at Yeshiva University Stern College for Women, uh, where he teaches American literature and various writing courses. Um, he holds a PhD in English literature from the University of Iowa, and he holds an MFA in creative writing from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Um, he's interested in 19th and 20th century American literature, poetry, poetics, digital humanities, and book studies. He has received numerous awards, and his latest book is The Collage of Myself, Walt Women and the Making of Leaves of Grass, about which he will speak tonight. His articles, poetry reviews, and interviews have appeared in many distinguished publications, including the Arizona Quarterly, the AWP Writer's Chronicle, uh, Book History, Cro Colorado Review, Denver Quarterly, Iowa Review, Jacket, New Letters, Prairie Schooner, Verse, and Vault. Uh, and then, now, on that note, here is our speaker. Hi, everybody. Walt Whitman didn't have to deal with the seven train. He just had fairies. Um, all right, so thanks for your patience. Um, I'm glad this worked out. I, for about 15 minutes there, thought that uh, it wasn't going to work out. So I'm relieved. And um, I know I pre it's hard to make it out when everyone's so busy this time of year, so I really appreciate everyone coming out. So let me first start by talking a little bit about the 200th anniversary of Whitman's birthday and some of the exciting events that are going around New York as New York City celebrates Walt Whitman. And uh, once the lecture notes get here, I wasn't able to actually print out my lecture because of the train snafu. Um, I'll start with the lecture proper. So. Uh, May 31st is the 200th anniversary of Walt Whitman's birthday, and New York is the place to be for all things Walt Whitman. We have uh, about four months of celebrations, can't pack it all into one day or even one week. Um, one that I want to alert to any Whitman fans about that may be particularly interesting is a seminar that's taking place at the Grolier Club. If you've never been there, it's amazing. It's the oldest library in New York. It's a, also a kind of book club. It's, it's kind of like a wizard's library with, you know, stairs up to second floor bookshelves and giant books with magnifying glasses in drawers on top of them. And it's a really a wonderful place. And there'll be, um, on his birthday, there'll be a day of uh, presentations, talks, poetry readings by important Whitman scholars. And my, own, my mentor, Ed Folsom, the dean of Whitman Studies, longtime editor of the Walt Whitman Quarterly Review, will be giving the keynote address. That one's not to be missed. Celebrities will be celebrating Walt Whitman. Uh, Bill Murray is going to be giving a reading of Walt Whitman's poems at the Poet's House in Battery Park. Um, the, any of you guys, you know the show The Warriors, the movie The Warriors, cult film, anybody? No? Okay. Quickly fading from cultural memory, but the actor in that is giving a Whitman presentation. He's also played Jerry in the television show Twin Peaks. A couple nods? That's good. Um, so if you want to hear Jerry from Twin Peaks play Whitman, this is like your only chance ever. Um, I'll be giving talks at the Brooklyn Public Library, as well as the Grolier Club and, and this talk. And I'm also giving a talk at CUNY in June. So um, my talk today is of particular interest to creative writers and anyone who practices poetry or prose. It's a case study of the creative process. I'm going to try to give you about a 20-minute overview of my book, kind of the bullet point version of the high points of the book. And I'm going to explain to you the peculiar and interesting way that Walt Whitman came to write his unique poems. And in the process of doing so, discovered a creative technique which about 50 years later came to be known as collage, which many critics argue is the signature creative method of modernism. 
both in the visual arts and in the literary arts. Usually the uh, uh, honors for inventing collage go to Picasso. Um, the word collage means to glue. And he um, was the first to glue found art objects onto a canvas. Um, and he often gets the honor. Then we usually move on to uh, Marcel Duchamp um, and his use of found art practices, who sort of theorized it and uh, made it into a portable idea uh, that has been of uh, tremendous use and importance to both writers and artists. My point today is that as great as Duchamp and Picasso are, um, Walt Whitman actually deserves credit for being the first major artist to in involve and appropriate found art objects into a previously existing work. Um, it might be better to call it montage, although the distinction may be lost on some because montage is usually thought to involve more control over the found parts that come together, montage being a film term and collage being more of a visual arts term. But I thought collage myself had a better ring to it. Um, so um, Walt Whitman is a poet of many distinctions. We see it here in this 1862 photograph by Thomas Eakins. He's the most widely translated poet from the United States. His book, Leaves of Grass, is the best-selling book of secular poetry ever published. Uh, he's the most widely read and widely known literary figure outside of the United States, and that includes prose writers. Um, it's long been a literary mystery how this person who started out as a rather undistinguished newspaperman, an author of potboiler temperance fiction, transformed himself with, I think, astonishing speed into the poet I just described, America's most successful and famous poet. And many people have uh, banged their heads against various archives uh, trying to figure out the solution to that mystery. And I believe I, I figured it out um, with my first book, or at least I think I have the best explanation that we've heard so far. So that's what you're about to hear now. Um, I'll just go grab this. That's the slides. Even Homer Simpson knows who Walt Whitman is uh, from the classic episode where he goes to Walt Whitman's grave and curses Walt Whitman and kicks on his, uh, his tune there. So here's a young Walt Whitman from a picture taken when he was about 27 years old, a young dandy and man about town, a Brooklynite, uh, kind of a socialite. I like to call this the hipster Whitman, sporting a facial hair long ahead of its time, long ahead of its time. Um, you see that look now today in Williamsburg and Bushwick, I think, a little bit. Um, but this was a young man who hadn't yet found himself. He knew he wanted to do something great. He knew that he wanted to be a writer in some sense. He'd been working for newspapers. But aside from this vague impulse to do something great and important, Whitman really hadn't found himself as either a human being or an artist when this photograph was taken. Um, Whitman, in fact, really had no clue what even what art form his book would take. Um, I'll show you why we know that in just a minute. Um, my recent book, Collage Myself, Walt Whitman and the Making of Leaves of Grass, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press several years ago, corrects many of these misunderstandings and adds another distinction to this already distinguished feature figure of American literary history. As I mentioned, long before Pablo Picasso supposedly invented the technique in the visual arts, Walt Whitman was already practicing, and what's more, theorizing this mode of artistic production that today goes by the word collage. So let me try to take you back to 1840 when Whitman was hanging around Brooklyn and taking notes. Um, he worked part-time as a construction worker. One of his distinctions is he's the first canonical world-class poet from a working-class background, mostly for reasons having to do with literacy and class. Uh, Whitman was the first poet from a, a poor background to achieve the kind of stature of a poet like Milton or Shakespeare. And um, Whitman had a feeling about this, like I said. So he started in the 1840s by becoming an autodidact, by checking out books from the library, um, taking notes, studying up on human anatomy, on 
animal life, botany. He checked out a book on, called Birds of Manhattan for three months and took copious notes on all the bird species in that area. Whitman was really interested in his environment. And he knew that whatever he was going to do was going to involve that stuff. So the, the real origins of Whitman's creative process begin with these notebooks, where he began taking these notes on various topics that he knew were interesting to him, but he didn't know how it would fit into any kind of larger picture. He was also busy as a family man, taking care of his mentally handicapped brother, Eddie, who lived with him the entire time while he was riding Leaves of Grass, shared the same room with him. Um, he had to take care of his family by and large too because his father was an alcoholic and his mother couldn't count on her husband, his father, to uh, you know, bring home sufficient money to keep the family afloat. So Whitman was the uh, elder in his family um, and he was charged with not only his brother but his whole family's well-being. While he was doing all of this, his family was moving around and Whitman was moving with them, taking along with him these notebooks um, and writing in them. And it's to these notebooks that we've turned to to try to understand how Whitman wrote the most important book of poems written by an American. Um, it's long been thought, prior to my book was published, that the time when Whitman created Leaves of Grass, when he first started thinking about it and writing down lines that later led to Leaves of Grass, was 1847 eight years before the publication of the first edition of Leaves of Grass. And the evidence for why this was believed to be so comes from this manuscript leaf, which is from a notebook housed at the Library of Congress in the Harned Collection. And uh, if you look at the top of this notebook leaf, you can see the date 1847 and then April 19th and some notes about a mason and a workman commencing work on the base on the basement rooms, as it says, and then paying the mason in full. We know that these notes refer to his job as a, um, a carpenter and a house builder, which was uh, how his family kept afloat. Whitman's newspaper writings paid a small portion of their income, but they were trying to cash in on this real estate splurge that had overtaken Brooklyn. As Brooklyn drained its marshes, more livable land was becoming available, and Whitman's family tried to make money off of that. So he had been working with this mason. They saw these notes, and then they read these, uh, previous Whitman scholars read these lines down here. And these lines, anybody who knows Leaves of Grasswell can recognize that there's phrases and lines in this prose passage that later became part of Song of Myself. So the fact that this passage here contains words that became part of his most famous poem, and the date up there led many scholars for the entire history of Whitman scholarship, really, to believe that Leaves of Grass took eight years for Whitman to write. Eight years sounds pretty fast to me um, for a great book like that, and a large, hefty book with lots of words. But the truth, it turns out, is much more strange and interesting, because actually holding this notebook revealed something totally different. You see, the reason why people believed what they believed about this is because up until recently, the only way you could access these materials was from grayscale digital scans that you would read on microfilm. These were very low def. These were not digital images. They couldn't be magnified like this. And they were very cumbersome to use, and very few people had even seen them. They were mostly known through translation in a typographic translation into a print book. And what you couldn't see on this black and white microfilm is that this material up here is in a different color pencil and different pressure and fading than this material here. This is in a brown pencil and this is in a regular gray graphite pencil. Um, when I visited the Library of Congress and checked out this notebook, I was one of the last people to have the privilege of holding it. You can't actually access the real document now, but I used to work for, I had a job as a grad student with the Walt Whitman Archive. And one of our tasks was to create digital images like this one. I took this picture. That's, that's a friend of mine's thumb up there. And um, these pictures are now all available at the Walt Whitman Archive, by the way. So anybody who wants to study this stuff can do so with just a click now. But actually holding these notebooks instead of looking at the microfilm revealed something about them that totally changed how we look at it. And it became the sort of epistemological foundation for my book, how I know what I think I know about this. Um, what we discovered when we actually held this notebook, and by the way, Whitman scholars refer to notebooks by the first legible text in, in them. And the first legible text in this notebook was the name of one of Whitman's acquaintances, a guy named Talbot Wilson. So I'm going to recall this the Talbot Wilson notebook. That's how Whitman scholars refer to it. 
So this other seemingly inconsequential image from the Talbot Wilson notebook um, revealed that this notebook had uh, dual purposes. It had different uses during the time when it was around. And what we saw was these, this is like the figures here. These are most, these are zeros, right? And there's all these stubs and they had been cut out. This, this line that you see right here going down the side and the reason why the eraser stub of this pencil is required here is because most of this page has been cut out and what's left is just this right hand, these right hand margin stubs which record financial records that the Whitman family kept for their expenses in building these houses. That wasn't that big a surprise, but the fact that Whitman had cut out so much of this material revealed that this notebook had been used in a totally different way than we had thought. Paper was expensive back then, right? So people couldn't really waste it, especially poor people like Whitman's family. So anytime you had paper, you used every corner of it. You didn't just recycle it or throw it away like you do today. So it turns out that this notebook had a long lifespan. It hung around Whitman's writing office for about 10 years. And in the earliest period of its history, it was used as merely for financial record keeping. So we found that all of the entries in this notebook, which have that pencil color associated with this material up here, all share the same financial quality. They're all about payments made. They're all about house building, all about things that were required for Whitman to do, this, do his job, right? It doesn't take too much thought beyond that to realize that what happened with this notebook is that it had a dual life. It started out as a mundane, pragmatic notebook for keeping notes, and then in an effort to recycle paper and save money, Whitman cut out, as you can see here, just took a knife and cut out the pages that came, contained material too full for him to use for his own notes, and he began then, and only then, using it to record lines that later became leaves of grass. So what that teaches us is that this man, the poet who launched Leaves of Grass in 1855. This is the famous frontispiece image to the first edition of Leaves of Grass. This man used that notebook for only one year prior to 1855 when the book was published right around July 4th, 1855. One year. That means all of the poems in Leaves of Grass came together not in seven or eight years, but in one year. Well, that was a game changer. Realizing that really, um, I knew I was onto something. I knew I had a, a, something I could turn into a, a book, into a dissertation. I didn't know exactly what I had, but I knew it was important. Um, so I started out trying to make that case, that we, Leaves of Grass was made in a single year. The question comes up, how did you do it? How do you create so many great poems in, in one year? While well, you're working, too, taking care of your family, working full-time hours over the course of various jobs. How do you do it? Well, Whitman figured out a method that allowed him to write very, very quickly. Now, you'll recall how earlier I had talked about during the time when Whitman was teaching himself, when he was an autodidact, he was taking notes, like I said. And I mentioned bird notes and no anatomy notes, botany notes. Well, all those notes existed in these trunks and notebooks. And they weren't poetry. They were prose. They, no they weren't written with the intention of being poetry. Um, Whitman would go on walks, sometimes he'd go to the library and take notes, sometimes he would take notes on sites around Brooklyn. He loved riding on the top of omnibuses, which was the public transportation of those days. Um, he'd drop down things people said, and he had notebooks full of mundane, prosaic materials. So what happened was, Whitman realized that if he didn't write the kind of poems everybody else was writing, formal, metered, controlled, rhymed poems, in formal poetry, you have this sort of interlocking architecture to things where if you change one part, you have to change the rest. Like rhyme demands that, right? Um, if you're writing in meter, it requires a certain consistency that makes it a lot harder to move stuff around. You, anybody who's ever written even a simple poem knows what I'm talking about. You can't just shuffle lines in a rhyme poem. You have to make it sound right. But if you're not writing in that form and you're writing in more of a serial form where one thing just comes after another, you're not, there's no meter, there's no rhymes, and you're using these long, baggy, capacious lines that can hold a lot. And more than that, if you do away with most conventional punctuation and replace it with ellipses, three dots, um, then you have this really uh, kind of one-size-fits-all uh, formal vehicle that can recuperate all this other stuff that Whitman had been doing during those eight years. 
So first Whitman discovered his line. I could go into how he discovered it. That's another story. Uh, part of it was based on his love of the Bible. Part of it was based on this fly-by-night self-help book by a guy named Martin Tupper called Proverbial Philosophy. Proverbial Philosophy probably had a bigger influence than the Bible formally on Whitman's line. That's another story. But the fact is he did discover the line and once he did, he, he realized, aha, now I know how to do it. I can go through these notebooks and I can spruce them up, I can juice them up, I can cut them out, literally cutting them out, that is with a knife or scissors and using glue, and I can rearrange them and play with them. And that play and that portability that was implied by his discovery of this long, unstructured line is what led Whitman to become Walt Whitman. That's the turning point that uh, transformed that undistinguished newspaperman into the author of Leaves of Grass, into this guy. So now I want to take you to another important notebook that adds another piece to the puzzle. And how am I doing on time so far? About five minutes left? OK, I'll, I'll hurry it up. So in this other um, notebook entry, it's hard to read here, but I'll help you out. It says, novel, work of some sort, play, question mark, uh, instead of sporadic characters, introduce them in large masses. And he goes on to write notes about how he wants to introduce full form, perfect athletes. It's this part up here that's interesting to me. Novel, play, work of some sort. This is obviously Whitman trying to figure out what his life's work is going to be. This notebook passage dates to 1853, late 1853. This notebook passage proves that at, as late as November 1853, Whitman had no idea that his life's work would assume the form of poetry. As late as late 1853, just about a year and, what, six months until Leaves of Grass comes out. He doesn't even know it's going to be poetry. He thinks it might be a novel or a play. The discovery of that line changed all that. And it turns out that these lines here, which describe introducing people in large masses, work great, but not as a play. They work great for those lists of people that populate his poems. You know how his poems have long lists of examples of things? Well, that's what he wants. Turns out that's what he's talking about in this passage, which shows incredibly that as recently as a year and a half before Leaves of Grass came out, he had no idea he was even going to be a poet. Now let me turn your attention to another object of interest that I discovered at the, uh, in the uh, archives of the Library of Congress. This photograph here had long been known to Whitman scholars. This is from much later in his life. He's living in Camden, New Jersey. He's about four years from his death. Um, this is his writing office. And while we don't have pictures of Whitman's writing office from Brooklyn when he was writing the first poems of Leaves of Grass, we have every reason to believe that it probably was something like this. So people knew about this image, but they didn't, what they didn't know is that there are more pictures like this hanging around. Um, when, I, when I went to the, to the Library of Congress, I asked for the folder that I knew this one was in because I was interested in every image we had of Whitman's writing space. I wanted to know how his writing space shaped his poems, his office space. And what I found was is that in addition to this higher quality image, there were these throwaway images that the photographer, I forget his name right now, had uh, not included with his submitted batch, but they were still there in that folder at the Library of Congress. And I found this image. You can see a little bit of what Whitman's office looked like, but in this next one, you can see something totally different. Um, so this, this image shows that Whitman was an artist who thrived in messiness, an artist who uh, really wanted uh, as much chaos around him as he could, as he could manage. Um, and I'll tell you a, short, a very short story. When he was out of town to give a talk on Abraham Lincoln once, some of his friends came to his house and they decided to do him a favor. They hired a housekeeper to come in and clean up his office. So Whitman gets back from giving this lecture on Abraham Lincoln. He comes back to his writing room. It's spotless. And a Whitman, a man not known for his temper, flew into a rage, started screaming at his friends. He was a very peaceful fellow and um, accused them of ruining his writing space. He said he'd never write another poem again. Everything, he, he, he claimed that everything was exactly where he wanted it and all he had to do was reach down to find anything he wanted. Um, so that messiness kind of feeds into his discovery of collage technique as well. Um, let me show you an example of a manuscript leaf from when he was deep into the process of composing his poems. This leaf is, is a bit like a palimpsest, a series of layers of text, one over the other. This is from a poem called You Tides with Ceaseless Swell and Ebb. 
And if you look over here on this side, you see how these irregular edges of the strips here? Well, there are at least seven different layers of strips of paper glued one on top of the other in this palimpsest-like layering of lines that eventually came together to form this rather minor poem in Whitman's oeuvre. Uh, if you look, though, you can also see like all these different colors of ink and all these cross, cross outs and insertions. This is how complicated writing is for most of us. It, for very few of us do poems come out like immaculately conceived and um, you know, without necessary revision. Whitman worked aggressively revising. And look, look at how these, look at these layers here. You can really see it on this side as these different layers of paper glued over one over the other. I wanted to take them apart, but the library wouldn't let me. So um, some of the material that leaves, lies behind that will have to wait for um, somebody who can use technology to unpeel it and find out what's back there. I suspect it's probably just worse lines for the poem. But um, So that's Whitman's writing process. And he took it even further, too. And another visitor came to his writing office once, and there were these strings hanging from the rafters, and the top, there was an open ceiling with beams going across it, like that. And from the beams were tied strings, and to the strings were glued these little strips of paper. There were little pins on the strings, and the guy asked asked him what this stuff was in Whitman's writing space, and he says, I'm working on a poem. See? And then he, put, he pulled the string up, and he pulled one of the lines up to another arrangement and clipped it there. And he was using these strings. You guys ever seen that children's book called Heads, Bodies, Tails, where you make monsters from different pages? You know what I'm talking about? The head with one body with the feet of another. That's sort of how, like how these poems came together. Frankenstein-like, built from many spare parts. Um, pieced together in this rough and tumble way that really resembles collage, I think. So to me, that is collage. That's literary collage. And when you're taking different kinds of text, you know, some of the things Whitman collaged, and I'll wrap this up, um, included um, certain reviews that he wrote of his own books. He took lines from his own self-published reviews and turned them into poetry. He, he, the last, in, in my uh, Transcendentalism class, some of my students are here today, we just got done studying uh, I Sing the Body Electric, and you remember the long list of body parts at the end? That whole long list of body parts comes straight out of an anatomy textbook, except for a couple of the naughty bits that he gave his own euphemistic renderings for. Um, but most of it, straight up collage. Um, I could go on and on. He, he took a newspaper account of a Civil War battle, arranged it into lines and presented it as a Civil War era poem at a, a war that, a battle he never saw. Um, you can go through poem after poem after poem and find this stamp, this kind of creative stamp on Whitman's process. So that's the birth of collage, the birth of these poems of materials, as Whitman puts it in this manuscript draft on the top line there. Poems meant to supply the materials for people like you who write poems. Poems meant to be recycled again just as Whitman recycled the language to make these, he presents to us this language for us to remake it and reuse it in a spirit of generosity um, as a kind of giving. Um, so through the process of collage, Whitman kind of sanctifies this language as poetry and presents it as materials for our own creative endeavors. And on this 200th anniversary of Whitman's birth, you can look at one of the first uh, celebrated collage works of Picasso here. Um, we can line Whitman up with Picasso and with Marcel Duchamp, this famous ready-made uh, bottle drying rack, um, bicycle wheel. Um, so 200 years now, we can see that Whitman is the one who uh, first came up with this method. And ever since then, we've been chasing after him and creating our own versions. So that's it. Tell us some more about the Walt Whitman Archive. Sure. Uh, the Walt Whitman Archive is a kind of flagship project. Most major authors have their own websites now, but few of them are as robust and uh, helpful as the Walt Whitman Archive. Uh, Walt Whitman Archive, for example, every not only every published version of all of his books is there in both print form and in digital facsimile. We've also included about, at this point, 90% of the known manuscripts in fully searchable um, XML, a searchable internet language text. So the job of hunting through Whitman's documents to learn more about him is now much easier, um, thanks to the Whitman Archive, where with just a click, you can get these archival materials, which people like me previously had to travel hundreds of miles and 
you know, shuffle through dusty stacks of folders and files and so on. It's now all online. I understand that the archives is, is doing some work uh, with um, Yiddish translations of it. Yeah, I, well, I was. Um, I'm hoping to finish it. I haven't, um, I haven't found somebody who can help me yet. But if uh, you know anybody who loves poetry and is uh, can read Yiddish fluently, who wants to uh, work on a, a translation project with me, um, I'm looking for help. Uh, we, um, Whitman was enormously influential with early 20th century Yiddish language, Jewish immigrant poets, mostly in the Lower East Side. Um, he was their hero. They found in him, a, they loved his like Bible-like lines, these kind of long bardic lines that resemble the lines of the great Hebrew prophets. And um, they, they were influenced by him. They wrote poems like his. And, one of those poets, a guy who uh, shares um, an anglicized version of my last name, um, Miller, um, who started a translation of Leaves of Grass in Yiddish. Um, and he finished it, but he never published it, but we have it. And so uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to um, publish it online. I would like to uh, get it there so that scholars can use it for their research and search materials. And we, I got about halfway through that project with various student assistants, and then I ran out of help, basically, I, because I can't read Yiddish. I wasn't able to finish it, so that project's languishing. Do you know anybody? <laughs> I was working with a couple of students from the uh, like Chlad Lubavitch movement who grew up speaking Yiddish in Midwood and South Brooklyn with their families, but we haven't had as many students from Chabad, so it's a bit harder for me to find people with the Yiddish skills or with the uh, desire to do it. My understanding of Whitman is that he thought of himself as quintessentially an American, creating an American uh, genre, an American voice. Yeah. But what, what was he thinking of when he was doing that? That's a great question. Um, Whitman was thinking that America needed its own poet. This was a day and age when literature had much more cultural cachet. And it was a great country had its great poet. Italy had Dante, England had Shakespeare, Germany had Goethe. The United States had these minor uh, forgettable poets who wrote poems in imitation of European formal verse. Whitman attended a lecture given by the American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson in New York in 1851 at the offices of the New York Herald where Emerson read uh, a speech that later became published and known as The Poet, his essay The Poet. And when Whitman heard Emerson give that lecture, Whitman thought to himself, that's me. I want to be that poet. And he set about this process, which I just described, of teaching himself and, and preparing himself to be some kind of, I shouldn't say that. He thought, I want to be like that poet. He didn't know it was going to be poetry. Um, but I think it was a combination of Emerson's influence, his patriotism. Um, his family was very patriotic. Two of his brothers were named, one of his brothers was named George Washington Whitman. Another of his brothers was named Thomas Jefferson Whitman. So patriotism, newspaper work, desire to be great, and a greater cultural presence and value accorded to poetry. What was his relationship to religion, or his understanding of what religion was? Whitman was a, a Whitman wasn't orthodox in any way. He was critical of formal religion. Um, his views are what I call post-transcendental. They're based in transcendentalist philosophy and metaphysics, which in turn is based in a split between certain philosophers and the Unitarian Christian Church in the 1840s. Ralph Waldo Emerson started out as an ordained Unitarian minister. So the religious roots of Whitman are Christian Unitarianism, but he was a, he was a religious rebel. Um, I think he's one of our great rebels, and, and I don't think he ever quite escaped his own religious impulses, but he translated those spiritual and religious impulses that he felt within his soul into, a, into his own verse. And he was, he was very bold in his desire to uh, both translate those whisperings that he heard inside himself and to claim great value for them. In one note that we, it's been, received a lot of attention 
Whitman writes the phrase, uh, write the great American Bible. Whitman scholars have interpreted that since then, and I'm not sure this is correct, but it's, it's been interpreted since then as Whitman wanting to make leaves of grass into that Bible. Whether that's true or not, I don't, I, I, I'm not gonna say right now, but I can tell you that that's what 99% of Whitman scholars believe. That he thought, that's what he thought leaves of grass would be, the new American Bible. He thought of himself as a prophet? I think so. Uh, sort of interlocutor, somebody who was specially blessed with divine, and he thought that the religious impulses around him were dead, were calcified, were, uh, he thought Christianity, which, which is what he was talking about when he attacked religion, specifically attacking mostly Puritan Christianity, he thought that it was it more or less a dead religion, that it lost touch with its spiritual roots and it needed to be revitalized, born again, so to speak. To his ages. His and everybody's, you know, he, he thought that everybody had it within them to be the same, just as great as he was. You know, the first lines of his poem, um, his first lines of the first poem in, his, in the book I just talked about go like this. I celebrate myself, and what I assume, you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me is good belongs to you. And that was his philosophy. He had an enormous ego, but he thought everyone else deserved to have one too. He wanted everyone to be kings of their own kingdoms, those kingdoms being their imagination. And so um, we can fault Whitman for hubris, um, but uh, I wouldn't fault him for being someone who um, felt uh, supercilious or superior to others. Um, he, was, he believed in Emerson's doctrine of self-reliance, and that when it came to religion, he believed in self-reliance as well. In the book, you raise the question, you say, if he, if he composed by taking from here and there, putting it together, the question you raise is, what, what did he think constituted originality in art? That's a great question. Great question. Um, it's really complicated. There have been books written about it. I could point you to them, but that's not what you guys want to hear. Quick version. Um, Whitman thought language was an estate, a public estate, not a private estate. And he wanted everyone to have their own room in it, their own mansion. Um, and this poem, poem of materials idea that I ended with during my lecture is his explanation for that. Um, he thought that if, if he could sanctify language into poetry and present it as a public estate that anyone can share and recycle and reuse in their own way, that he could create a new kind of poetry, a radically democratic form of poetry that he could make available to everyone and would revolutionize how we think about language and literature. So, um, he didn't have the same notions of copyright and propriety that we have today. Which relates to the other question I wanted to ask you. Could you say uh, how being a newspaper man related to his work as a Well, related directly to what we were just talking about, because in those days, much more so. Today, we still reuse copy, right? Most small town newspapers reprint material from Reuters or AP or the New York Times. And you see that in the credits at the end of the articles, right? But it was even more that way when Whitman was into newspapers. Very little of the stuff printed in newspapers was original. It made its rounds. They reprinted their own. They recycled each other's work. There was no, it was a Wild West copyright-free attitude where whatever you could get away with went flew. So that, that kind of anything goes copyrightless newspaper environment surely influenced him to be willing to take what he wanted from others' books and, and material and to think of language as something which we today call found, found art, found text. Did he know Emerson personally? Did they have a relationship? He sent a copy of Leaves of Grass to Emerson. Um, Emerson read it. He loved it. He wrote him a very famous letter back. The first sentence of that letter reads, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Whitman was thrilled. His idol loved his work. He announced him to be the next big thing in this letter. Whitman promptly took that sentence and without permission had it emblazoned on the spine of the second edition, inventing the first literary blur. The first time any writer, and this is a fact, the first time any writer had the, what's that Yiddish word, the chutzpah, to, sorry, my age isn't so good, um, to, uh, uh, take someone else's uh, praise and, and use it to sell books was Whitman, that great salesman. And uh, Emerson seems to have forgiven him. Emerson, he, Whitman wrote a letter back. He started the letter, Dear Master. He thanked Emerson. 
Emerson said, wrote him back, he said, I want to visit you. Emerson, who very seldom left Boston, um, left his estate, took a long trip to New York to, to visit this guy that he thought was the greatest thing ever. They met, they had many, they had, they had a few conversations, and they did have a, both an epistolary relationship through letters, and, they, and they, they met each other a few times. Whitman, in turn, went and visited Emerson. So they met a total of um, either three or four times, we're not sure, and they exchanged many letters. Did Whitman have, was there a, like a coterie of writers, or was he, or did he live with, you know, uh, uh, you know workers, construction workers, you know, like newspaper men? Another great did question. A, did he have a literary uh, life? Did he have a He had a split life. Um, he, 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 during the day, he hung out with working class folks, and, um, at night, he would go to a, a bar called Bath's, which is uh, located on Bleecker and Broadway, in this shoe store there now. Um, and there he would meet with other writers, actors, artists, and they would do it at actors and writers and artists, do at bars, drink and talk and stay up and regale each other with stories. So um, he, he kind of had a dual life, working class man by day and literary guy by night. Well, there were other poets. I think there was one other poet just as great, um, Emily Dickinson. Um, uh, were there other people that were living that kind of bohemian lifestyle like him? Yes, there were. There were other. Um, this bar, Fast, was a hotbed for uh, artists and people that adopted non-traditional lifestyles. Um, some people believe that this was the first gay bar in New York. It's celebrated that way by the LGBTQ community. Um, it's commemorated by the Stonewall Group. Um, so, um, yeah, there were there were actors, opera stars, other newspaper journalists, even some poets who just didn't become as famous as him, but shared ideas and stuff. Did, did he ever have a problem with coming out? Or? He never came out. He went to his grave in, in the closet. Yeah, he, he, uh, his close friends and lovers obviously knew, but he didn't, you know, make it apparent to the public. Um, others knew, everybody knew. It was, a, it was an open secret. Um, Oscar Wilde, you know who Oscar Wilde is, knew. Um, and he, in fact, took a boat across the Atlantic to meet Whitman and hug him, and he did. He met him, he went to his house, just like so many others, like Emerson, like Thoreau like Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, like Mary Wollstonecraft, like Margaret Fuller. They all took their pilgrimages to meet Whitman, and uh, Oscar Wilde did, and they kissed, and he got his signature, his autograph, and they, never, they didn't speak. That was the last, the only time, one only time they met. Um, late in his life, he was asked about it by a man who was out, a guy named Simmons, and he denied it. Um, I, most people believe that he just, couldn't foresee a time when someone could be a Milton-like or a Shakespeare-like major poet and promote themselves as openly gay. Now we know today that most likely Shakespeare was bisexual. If Whitman had known that, maybe it would have provided some comfort to him. Um, but uh, he didn't have that courage or comfort. He hid it, kept it hidden. It's very sad. Those are the times. Different times. Very, most people couldn't get it. You know, people would read his book and they they would they were offended, but they weren't offended by the fact that it seemed like um, someone with a different sexual orientation. It, it seemed like they were offended because just it was just plain graphic. It was. It's not graphic by our standards. It would receive barely a look. It would be PG-13 type stuff. But for his day, it was quite graphic, and he was attacked as being too sexy. But they assumed he was straight. Only one of the early reviewers that criticized his book recognized Whitman's sexual orientation. He referred to, he, he of course hated the book and said that uh, Whitman even seems to be, and I quote, a practitioner of that love which shall not be named. <laughs> so I'll let you make of that what you will. My last question for you is, how has Whitman influenced you as a, as a practicing poet? As a poet? Well, until recently, very little as a poet. As a person, he's affected me a lot. I mean, until I started reading Emerson intensely a few years ago, I guess I kind of thought that a lot of my worldview was shaped by Whitman in terms of my views on politics and um, religion or lack thereof and creativity. 
but I didn't really think my poems were very influenced by Whitman. But a couple years ago, I've started writing this new kind of poem that is, uses anaphora really aggressively. In fact, all I use is an Afro, and they're even, they use repetition um, really insistently, and I didn't set out trying to imitate Whitman, but looking back on it, now I have like hundreds of pages of this stuff, and, and um, looking at it now, I can see that it's my own sort of subdued and quiet and batic version of Whitman, kind of Whitman for a hollowed out age. Um, so I think recently it started, finally has got under my skin and influenced my own poetry, but for most of my writing life, I avoided Whitman. I prefer Ashbury, John Ashbury. I guess we'll open up the floor to questions. Anybody have a question? Hi, Hi. good to see you. Um, have you ever taught a class in this Um In my second year at Stern, nine years ago, I, I taught a class on Whitman and Dickinson, just those two. Um, but uh, only enrolled with about six people. Um, and when we, when we discussed it with the dean, um, at the time, Dean Bacon was Dean of Stern, and she, we, she and I had a talk, and we decided that I wouldn't offer just single author or dual author classes because they, don't, they have that long history of not enrolling very well. So I teach Whitman all the time, but I teach him in the context of transcendentalism and American Lit II. When I teach Ways of Reading, I teach Leaves of Grass and Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. So he gets about a third of the class there. But um, it's kind of hard to teach just one author in an undergraduate class with this few English majors with a small student body like this. It's a little bit too focused. You mentioned Eric. Whitman is the music. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not getting any better yet. Uh, where you have the strings. Yeah, like a mobile kind of. Did he use that for all his poetry? Not all of them, no. Um, it's, it, in fact, he probably didn't, that probably wasn't like his main way of writing poems. I suspect his more common way looked more like the glued on, the strips of paper image that I showed you guys. I just think it makes a great story, you know, this mobile. And it also makes a nice connection to the visual arts because the lines are starting to achieve like a visual art dimension when they're hanging from rafters on a string like that. You know, they're, they're using space in a way that you can't in a book. So it makes a nice connection, but I don't think that was his most prominent way of writing poems. Yeah. Um, when Logan would miss in that sort of his poems, would he just pick, I mean, I don't know if you know this, or if any of this, but would he pick them at random and then connect them and therefore make the poem? Or would he choose pieces specifically that are the poem or something? That's a great question. It's a really awesome question. And that's the question that I uh, took up in my third chapter. Um, the chapter's title is, uh, um, has the phrase spinal ideas in it. Spinal ideas is Whitman's concept phrase for the organizing principles that he would use to structure these disparate lines. So he, would start, he called it spinal because he liked the body metaphors, organic metaphors. So just like the body has a spine, the bones symmetrically fit in with it, Whitman liked to imagine that his poems had a spinal idea that the lines would cohere to. So he wrote, he wrote down these spinal ideas in his notebooks, phrases like, he wrote one called, uh, um, he wrote like, hello poem, which later became uh, salute monde, salute, hello to the world. Um, uh, and it's a, composed of different ways people in different countries salute and greet each other. He had one, he wrote down banjo poem, and he wrote a short poem which he never published about different stringed instruments popular in the United States at the time, bird poem, etc. So he would start with these concepts called spinal ideas, and then he would begin to assemble, assemble previously written notes around those, and then he would fill that in with his own original writing that would connect it and make it kind of piece it together better which is why montage might be a better term from a theoretical point of view, because theorists that talk about these things point out that collage is usually has these rough edges. It's not like those images from Picasso, like they're not, it's not pretty, you know, like they're not smoothed over. Montage in film is more smoothed over. You know, like in a film when you show like a quick, bunch of quick images to portray time quickly, like flashbacks to show like the passage of that kind of thing. That, that maybe that's a better metaphor. Um, because Whitman was rather controlling in his collage. It wasn't his kind of like, let it all hang out, as you might think from some of those pictures I, sh I showed. He did often write new stuff to connect the dots between them. 
But that was his main method. His final ideas, and then found text, and then fill in the dots in between. Is your book in the library? I'm sure it is. I have it out. Actually, I have Paul's copy. I can loan you. I have copies. I can I'll return. Just say hi to me in my office, and you can check out one for me. Or you can read it. It's also available free full text online at the Walt Whitman Archive. Oh, okay. If you don't mind reading the PDF. Um, in the process of writing a book and working at the Walt Whitman Archive, what would you say, other than what you mentioned here, that surprised you the most in your research today? Um, What's happening to us? I, I mean, there, I, it's, I, I don't know if I can tell you. Like, it's, it involves a story that. I'm not sure if I should tell it. No. I, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll talk. If you want to hear it one on one, I'll tell you the story. I'll give. I'll preface it. And if you still want to hear it, I'll tell you. But um, I'll tell you something else. Not the most shocking one, but something that I thought was really pretty shocking anyway. Um, the thing I just said that he wrote *Leaves of Grass* in one year. I was flabbergasted by that. I, I, it's a huge book. You know, the pages on it are like this. Um, and I, I, as somebody who struggled so long, you know, not only to write, just to write a book is hard enough, but to write something so original and to edit it and perfect it like that, well, here's something else. There's no one edition of Leaves of Grass, of the first edition. This shocked me. Whitman stopped the presses, literally stopped the presses. He oversaw the printing of his own book. And he made editorial changes while his book was being printed. And these editorial changes were to, uh, uh, occur in folded, if you look at a spine of a book, it's made out of folded things that are glued into the spine. And those, those folds, right? Like if you, because there's different folds and those are printed first before the spine's been given, there, it turns out that the changes are so aggressive that there is there are no two copies of the first edition of Leaves of Grass are the same. One of them will have a period here, one of them won't. One of them will have a word here, one of them won't. It's the most bizarre book ever. Chaos. It, 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 he loved it. You know, that was he loved that uh, idea that everyone was unique and different, kind of like people. You know? So there's a couple things that really shocked me. I'll, I'll tell you that story some other time, maybe if you want to hear it. So 1850s was when art in Europe started changing a lot, like modernism emerging. Like, would he have known about that? And would that have like changed the way he was also doing something different, or was it like it was really connected? I'm not sure. I mean, what? What are you thinking of, like Rombo? No, like, it, it doesn't later, right? Like he started oh, okay. changing perspective. Like, no, he's no longer. He did. He wasn't. He he was. He loved the visual arts, but he wasn't aware of like advanced French painting. He he uh, he liked what we call the luminous painters, American painters, giant, beautiful landscape paintings that depict, depict the sublime, very realistic. He wasn't up on that. I'm not sure how many Americans were at that time. That's a good question. Professor Young, I know. Well, would the art that he did see influence him? Does that influence his writings? Sorry? The art that he did see, did that influence him? Oh, writings? sure, yeah. I would say even more so than the luminous painters with the invention of uh, primitive photography, a daguerreotype, and other early cameras, and the way that they could be really shocked and uh, dazzled him. And I think the reproducibility of photographs probably also influenced his conceptual practice of reproducing lines like that. And he loved uh, Civil War photographs. Um, he, was, he collected them, and he had his picture taken every chance he could get. Like Mark Twain, he was a big hand. He wanted to, he wanted to be everywhere. So yeah, he, was, he loved photography. I'd say that was the biggest visual arts influence on him. Daguerreotype photography. I'm not sure what the right word is. Any other questions? Well, I hope to see some of you at these Whitman events. Um, and, uh, check it out. There's a lot of great stuff coming up. And um, thanks for coming.